Representing our entrepreneurs, Mr. Amir Sharif from Wazaf and Ms. May Methat from Eventus. Uh, and representing our lawyers, Mr. Ali Shalaini and Mr. Sharif Hafni. And our lovely moderator, Mr. Stephen Haley, is going to tell us everything we need to know. So is everyone ready? I want to see some enthusiasm, please. <laughs> All right. How's this? All right. So I'm not actually going to tell you anything. I'm just going to say may talk. Um, the, uh, as uh, what we're going to talk do real quick, we only got 40 or 25 minutes to go through something that is incredibly complicated, and a lot of you are going to have very specific questions on. So uh, we really are going to go as, as fast as we can without a whole lot of background information. Um, so then, if possible, we can open up to more question and answers at the end because everyone's going to have different problems that you've run into. So if it seems a little bit rushed, it's because 25 minutes to talk about something pretty complicated with all kinds of different pitfalls that you can uh, run into is really not a lot of time. Um, and the lawyers can tell you that for sure because they make a lot of money making sure they can talk to you about it for like five hours. Um, so there's no way we can cover it in 25 minutes. Trust them. Um, so the first thing, the way we're going to structure this is we have two entrepreneurs who have both gone through um, a number of different offshore domiciles and can say what their reasons were for those uh, decisions and what ended up working for them and what lessons they want to pass on. And then what we're going to do is have the, uh, the two lawyers kick in every once in a while if there's something that, that really is a point a lot of entrepreneurs need to focus on and then afterwards get their, the, the lawyers' opinions about overall what are they seeing in terms of trends and what should you as an entrepreneur know when uh, when you come and talk to a lawyer so you can save as much time and money as you possibly can um, and uh, so by the way these guys know because I'm friends with them I like to make fun of lawyers so no offense if there are other lawyers in the room before we do that though show of hands who here is a founder or founding team of a startup wow that's pretty good that's pretty targeted awesome okay uh, any lawyers in the room? Sweet. Um, and so just take everything they're saying as gospel. Um, all right, so first thing we're going to do is uh, start with May. If you can talk about, uh, if, if everyone doesn't know what Aventus is, you clearly hopefully do because you all downloaded the Rise Up app powered by Aventus. Amazing, amazing product. One of the best I've seen in coming out of Egypt. So congrats on that. Um, and also has gone through several rounds of fundraising. Both of them have. Um, so if you can start with what was your initial decision to offshore, where did you decide, and then uh, from what I understand, you, you switched at a certain point. So if you can take us through that process. Okay. Uh, thank you for the feedback on that. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. I'm ha very happy to be here. Uh, we actually started as a um, limited liability company, LLC, normal LLC, and then uh, it's a long story. So actually, when we start after that, when we got in the first round of investment, we uh, changed that and we registered as um, a stock option company uh, in registered in Egypt. And then uh, we changed that and we registered in Delaware and then we registered on BVI. So actually, I tried everything and it's very, very big hassle. So if you can save a lot of time, effort and money and do it right from the first time, it will be it, it will save you a lot of effort actually um, the main reason for for doing the BBI now we have we have the structure we have right now is BBI and then we have um, this is the holding company and we have a Dubai based company for the Dubai operations and we have Egyptian uh, LLC company for Egypt so so yeah. We usually recommend to people and I think the lawyers might agree with this that that you actually do start off with an Egyptian LLC so I think few people would say don't start with an Egyptian LLC because you need an operating license here, correct? So th yes. that most people generally say maybe go to you, but from what I understand, your challenge was taking on other investors before you decided to offshore. Yes. How many shareholders did you have when you decided to offshore? We have eight shareholders. So eight shareholders when you decided to offshore. Was that the was the complication of eight shareholders the biggest challenge? Yes. Definitely, uh, Sharif actually can talk about this. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have been in the process for like a year. Imagine trying to get 
um, sign it, uh, signatures from my eight shareholders. It's, it's a very big asset. So if you can do it before that, and you just get them in, in the BVI company, it will be much more easier. And why did you originally decide on Delaware? Uh, we, we thought it's better, uh, but then we, d we decided that we, we don't operate actually in the US, so we, we didn't need the Delaware. So, so the main reason for that was to have right an now. operating yeah. entity in the US, uh, but then, okay. Um, the process of getting the, um, getting the so once you, once you have an uh, Egyptian company, the process of getting that ownership switched to the BVI, uh, would you say that is the most, the biggest challenge that you've had? Yes, it's, it's very, very challenging, especially with a lot of shareholders and it's very time consuming. So it's, it's actually easier if you can just close this and open a new one. Okay, cool. Um, one lesson to pass off to people of, of what to do. If you could choose one thing to say in offshoring, remember this. It's just better, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't compare it with, with the Egyptian because uh, um, with the Egyptian stock company, it's just, just make sure you do it right. You do it from the beginning uh, and you have lawyers who, who understand because the process is very complicated. So you need someone to guide you through the process. So. Guys, do you have anything you wanna comment on May's experience and or her insight there? Or do you wanna wait till the end? Okay, so I mean, your same question. What were uh, take us through your journey of different domiciles, different registrations, why you made the decisions in those moments, and and at each stage of that, what were the lessons that you learned? Uh, so we we started uh, with an Egyptian LLC, and uh, we kept it this way for some time until we were able to uh, uh, get interest from global investors, mainly uh, five hundred startups in Silicon Valley. And most of the international investors, they are not, you know, they're not comfortable investing in our legal structure here in Egypt. So th that's why they require us to incorporate elsewhere. Uh, most of U.S. investors, the first thing they'll say is do incorporate in Delaware because this is what they know. And they tell it to everybody who, who, uh, who they're investing in. Uh, and we w I went into, I started the process of, incorporating Delaware, uh, but thankfully things, you know, didn't go out smoothly. And then I was advised otherwise that because we're not, we don't have plans of operating in the U.S. and don't have plans of having somewhere, uh, someone uh, staying there, uh, we decided we, the BVI was better, okay? Uh, Delaware is definitely good if someone is targeting the U.S. market or global market. Uh, it can be a very good option. You can have, you know, simplify your banking in the U.S. If someone needs easy uh, banking options in the U.S., definitely they can they should go for Delaware. Uh, otherwise, in our case, most of the regional VCs and even some of the European VCs, they prefer BVI or, you know, other options because Delaware, you know, if, if you incorpor incorporate in Delaware and then you try, you, you exit at some point, you have to pay a lot of taxes to uh, to the US. So that's why most investors, you know, you know, our side, you know, Europe region, they prefer BVI. Uh, we did BVI, the US investors were a bit reluctant, uh, but then it went uh, fine. Uh, the process is, you know, very extremely time consuming. You have to plan for it very early. Uh, it took us like months to do the BVI because they require too much paper paperwork. Uh, and then the most complex issue later on is to have this entity acquire the Egypt Egyptian entity. This also takes a lot of months. And uh, and the other thing we also had was, uh, you know, huge difficulty was doing uh, banking options, uh, offshore banking options, which is very complex uh, due to money laundry and, you know, many different trends, uh, global trends. Uh, banks are becoming more skeptical towards uh, uh, publications such as BVI. Uh, so it took us like more than a year to you know, get to have a bank and then it was through a personal connection. Uh, so 
definitely having done this, it, it, it saves on the long term. So in the future, if we decide to do further fundraising, it should be much, much smoother. Uh, the starting, you know, the starting is very complex. So moving in, in, I guess the same question to you then before we move on is, if there's one thing that you said, all right, this is what you should do when you start thinking about doing offshoring, what would, in one sentence, what's the, the advice that you give to an entrepreneur? Uh, you have to ask, you know, those who went through it. So if you, if someone's planning on Delaware, they have to find, you know, like, I think Instabug and some other startups, they did Delaware. So you have to ask these people, you know, how the, pro of course you have to ask the lawyers, but then the, the founders will have, you know, you know, founders perspective, which can, you know, incorporate both legal aspect and the business and investors aspect. And uh, another thing which is not very directly related to offshoring, but vesting. Uh, many people, uh, how, how many of you know vesting, what vesting is? Vesting. So obviously it's minority and vesting is extremely important whether you do uh, in BDI Delaware or you even do a startup here in Egypt. It's not, in, you know, in, it's not legal uh, legally here in Egypt. But vesting is, I think, the, of course, the lawyer can uh, explain it more, but it's, it's very important that, for example, when you have like two founders and, and you split the company 50-50% and then someone leaves the next day, they shouldn't take this 50% with them. Okay, so vesting is a, a mechanism to ensure that it's fair when some founders leave. You have to read about vesting, whether you incorporate in Delaware or BVI or in Egypt, it's extremely important. Cool. Thanks. So these are their uh, their experiences, and I think we'll we'll start having the conversation go further. When I want to jump to the to the lawyers, um, first we'll start it off with from the experience you just heard. Any key points? Let's start with Ali. Any key points that you'd like to highlight of the experience you just learned that either you see all the time or really like drive home? Do not mess this up as an entrepreneur. Yeah, sure. Um, I think they kind of touched at it at, at the end, which is. Uh, you know, we usually kind of say it at the beginning, which is identify the stakeholders that are involved in the decision making for offshoring or the potential stakeholders, right? So depending on whether you're doing it before investors come on board or you expect investors to come on board, <coughs> keep in mind their perspective. Once you've identified those stakeholders, have a plan. Uh, so I think, you know, both of you obviously suffered from kind of trying to go for Delaware first and then moving to BVI, that added a lot of uh, pain to the process. Um, and actually, the uh, the reasons that you explained are very valid. So you know, uh, as as an angel investor myself, uh, there's no you know you you know there's no hard and fast rule. Uh, you know, for tech or tech-enabled companies, you're looking at a Silicon Valley exit. So you think, okay, Delaware is probably better because the US investors are more familiar with it, which is probably exactly why you initially going for Delaware. Um, but then there's the, tax, there's the tax element, and then there's the banking element, right? Um, so I think, um, you know, the, the, I would just add that the main jurisdictions that we've seen are uh, Delaware, BVI, Cayman. Uh, what we're interestingly seeing now as well, um, and this, this has a, ta it's tax driven, is uh, Mauritius and Malta. And the reason for those is because uh, Malta and Mauritius have very good double taxation treaties with, with Egypt, um, and you can get residency there. So you can have a dom you know you can be domiciled if you pay and stuff like that. So, so that's something that the investors kind of look at, um, especially when you don't need to be, you know, BVI for the European investors or Delaware for the US investors, right? Uh, and they're they're very respectable uh, kind of jurisdictions, and they're. Uh, uh, you know, they have a lot of, uh, there's also bilateral investment treaties. I mean, without getting too technical, there's a lot of benefits for the, inve you know, for the investors, for the founders on the tax and the uh, and legal protection front. Um, so I'd say once you've identified the jurisdiction, uh, one thing that lawyers like a lot is uh, having a steps plan or a checklist, okay? Um, now for a lot of people, you know, it's like a checklist, yeah, it's okay. You know, you start off with a checklist and it's gonna change every day, so it's fine, you know, it's not really. No, if you have a good checklist and you kind of spend, you front load that time, uh, you you will save a lot of time going forward, you know, so... What, what do you mean by checklist? Yeah, so the way that we do it, and I'm sure, you know, well, I know that Sharif does as well, because uh, 
we've worked together, um, is you just look, you have, you know, uh, what needs to be done in chronological order, how long you anticipate that taking, okay, and trying to be as accurate as possible, and which party is responsible, and what the status of that step is, right? So, you know, if you, you, can, you can have an update every week, okay, and, and when that update happens with that checklist, you know exactly which part of the process is where, who's responsible, so if somebody's late, you can, you know, you have to have somebody project managing this, right? So the second and final, uh, or the final point of advice I'd say, is that, uh, you know, you need to make sure that your lawyer uh, knows what they're doing, and you need to also pro help them to project manage this, because a lot of the times, you know, if the lawyer's asking for documents from the investors, uh, you know, there's only so much they can do, right? So, so I think as an entrepreneur, you need to help out and say, look guys, you know, you guys are delaying this. This is costing us valuable time that can be going to our business, right? Uh, so that's, you know, it's a collaborative process, uh, but it needs to be very strongly pro project managed. So that checklist, is that something that an entrepreneur comes to you with, like they need to find one online, or you guys have that that you provide when they walk in the door? I, I think, I think your, uh, the law firm should provide that. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily part of that, but I, what I would recommend is if you go, I've never seen a lawyer that doesn't like a checklist, because they also want to know exactly who's doing what, and to agree from the start who's responsible. Because, you know, uh, a lot of the DD or the KYC documentation, they can help a lot, you know, with filling out the forms and things like that, you know, but in the end, they can't sign them, you know. So it needs to be signed by somebody who's responsible. If that delay is happening by that person, there's only so much they can do as a lawyer, right? You know, you can push them, chase them, but after a while, you need somebody, the principals really, you know, we call, you know, the principals, the investors, the founders, to kind of push and project managers and really drive the timetable. All right, Sharif, same question. Generally, uh, before we get into details, some, some things that you picked up that you'd like to comment on of what you've seen, trends you've seen, uh, that take these analogies into broader uh, startups. Broader startups, wow. Um, first of all, I think it's very much a case by case. Okay, each company, each founders, they have their own requirements, they have their own plans. So you need to take that into consideration especially when you're looking at talking to investors. Institutional investors, sometimes you'll find already have determined where they want their offshore jurisdiction to be. So sometimes this is difficult if you've already set up an offshore company and they're coming to you saying, actually, we only work out of Mauritius, but you've already got a BBI company. So there's a lot of things that needs to be taken into consideration. And in saying that, one of the biggest problems that we face, as May highlighted, is, is basically getting the paperwork together, which is the KYCs. The thing is, you find, is when you have institutional investors, the KYC has become a problem rather than individual investors. Individual investors are pretty straightforward. You get a passport, a utility bill, proof of address, that kinds of stuff. Institutional investors is an absolute nightmare because you have to get proper company documentation that has to be fully notarized and stamped and all the rest of it. So this is where the time really um, kind of goes away from, from kind of finishing the transaction. With regards to Amir's aspect, which is the bank, which is actually very, very important, and a lot of people don't realize that. Some offshore jurisdictions, you can't really open a bank account, in it? BVI being one of them. BVI is extremely difficult to open a bank account. Uh, minimum capital you have to keep in there is $100,000 and has to always be maintained. Uh, there's heavy restrictions on it. So what you find is that you've, you've set up this great offshore structure and, and it's brilliant and everything is, you finished all your KYCs and is fantastic, but you can't open a bank account, and this creates a nightmare. Um, and then you've got other different jurisdictions, so, you know, Mauritius is easy to open a, 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 um, a bank account, and you have a double tax treaty, as Ali just said, but then the double tax treaty kicks in, so you actually need to have 51% of your board can't be Egyptians, because then it'll be considered an Egyptian company. So then that's a different requirement that kicks in, and then your investors will be very unhappy about that. So then you've got Malta as well. You've got Gibraltar. and Gibraltar, you can open a bank account, but you can open a bank account in Malta. So it's actually very, very complicated. Um, and that's why we always say, you know, the best thing to do is, you know, nice and early, go sit with your lawyer who knows what they've done. They've got experience. They've got a track record of setting up offshore companies and doing corporate restructuring. Sit with them. Talk to them about it. Ask them to provide you with the options based on what you're going to be doing in the next year or so. And only then will you actually have the plan in place and the checklist that Ali's speaking about because first questions will be like, okay, do you need a bank account? Yes, then BVI is out straight away, okay? Uh, are you going to operate in the US? Yes, then Delaware is an option. 
but Delaware, in order for you to have a bank account, you have to also have a US citizen or a resident that's based there. So that's another checklist you need to look at. So for each offshore jurisdiction, each one has its own requirements. So generally, what I always say is sit with a lawyer, talk to them, go through everything, try to ask as many questions as possible, um, and work with the lawyers as a team. Don't just kind of give them everything and say, you get on with it. My last thing actually, which is which both May and, and Amir did quite nicely, was that they actually took control of it. Um, what I've seen happen sometimes is startups will go through an offshore, set up an offshore structure, and they'll leave absolutely everything to the lawyers, okay? So the lawyers will do all the instructions, will do everything, and they don't get involved. And then what will happen is it'll go along, and then they want to change lawyers. And this becomes a really big problem because the instructing party on the documentation are the lawyers, not the actual founders, which means that you have to go through the whole KYC process all over again for, all, for your lawyers, your new lawyers, your founders, everything else like that. And this causes a problem. So my advice generally is always be at the forefront. Yes, your lawyers are there to support, but they're not there to lead the company. You should know who your agent is. You should be knowing when your billing are coming through, how much your fees are, everything like that. You should really, really be focused on that as well. So that's from my perspective. So on that note, I think is kind of key. And so if you think about doctors, a lot of times complain that they get in a patient that just spent a couple of hours on WebMD figuring out that they have some kind of weird form of cancer, and then they come in and just it's 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 a challenge for them. Uh, on the other hand, you want them to be relatively uh, informed when they come and talk to you. What is your ideal client for both of you of, in terms of how much they know and how much like they might know the wrong information? W when someone comes into you, what are the right questions they w and right information that they should have already answered? So, Sharif. Wow. Okay. That's uh, that's a big. Uh, it's a long list to have the preferred client. Obviously, you guys are perfect, without a doubt. Um, look, I, I honestly believe that you know a client that comes in has done some research, understands what are their main requirements. I don't expect them to understand the full legal scope. I don't expect them to understand all the ins and outs of everything. At the end of the day, that's our job. That's what we get paid for. But I need to have a conversation that we're on the same level. So I need them to be able to kind of sit down with me and go, okay, here are my options. This is what I need. What do you advise me on and why? So having that conversation is very good when they know what they're talking about. They know about the different ju offshore jurisdictions, as I was saying, you know, bank account, all that kinds of stuff, fees, all the rest of it. The thing is, all the information is available. It's all online. You can actually have a look at it and get that information, sit down with Laura and talk about it. In addition to that is communication. And I always say this to everyone that I work with, like the most important thing is communication. If you've got a problem, don't leave it. Call, pick up the phone and call me. Speak to any of the lawyers in, in the office. Come in, have a coffee with me. Tell me what the problems are and we'll go through it together. Whether it's the application form, whether KYCs, whatever it is that needs to be done. Communication is key because that saves a lot of time and that saves a lot of problems that happen in the future. So as long as you keep that communication open, that's probably what I would say is required from any kind of client. Okay. Ali, same question very quickly. In, in terms of like the, the top three things that when somebody walks in, sometimes you might just say, seriously, dude, you don't know that? Like, do you need a bank account? I don't know. How do you not know that? What are the things that you just say, all right, if you walk in the door, these are the three things that you should know because your lawyer is going to ask you. Yeah. I'd say, uh, first of all, you need to be very, uh, the client should preferably know why they're doing this. I think one of the things that we always find very surprising is that um, for a lot of founders, they're actually convinced about doing the offshoring. Uh, they're like, the investors need this, so I'll do it. I don't really see the value creation. And I think that's, that's a bad way to start, right? Uh, so I think you need, as a founder, you need to understand why you're doing the offshoring. And the main driver is not only for your, not only for your investors, okay? And I think the second, you know, so one side of the spectrum is like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll offshore and then I won't pay taxes here. Okay, that's, that's not actually, so like, that's not the reason you should be doing offshoring. Tax optimization is becoming more and more difficult. Um, there, you can do tax optimization, but it's, it's not as easy as people think. And it shouldn't be the driver. It's one, it's one of the drivers, but it's not the main driver. So I think, you know, know the drivers, know why you're doing this. And I think the founders need to, feel that this is creating value. It's not just a waste of time. 
So you know, that's the platform that would be ideal for me. So I, those, I think those two things. And I think the third thing is, um, you know, I, I like the example you gave about, you know, like the doctor, you know, like, uh, sure, go on the internet. I mean, now, you know, there's so much information. Uh, there's actually too much information. That's the problem, right? So like, you know, I think that the list of stuff that we're talking about, you know, uh, is coming from a lot of experience, which I don't think we'd expect the, uh, the clients to know. That's where we add value, right? So I think go to the lawyer early on, uh, but make sure that if those uh, prerequisites, you know, you know, you know, you know why you're doing this, and you're convinced that you're doing it, and you believe it's, you know, it creates value. If you've got that platform, the rest should sort itself out. Okay, thanks. So at this point, um, we've gone through 25 minutes, and we're opening up for questions. Looks like we already got one. Do we have a microphone up front? Um, okay, um, um, uh, my question actually is kind of a um, question to the organizers and uh, to the uh, people here too. Uh, this session, uh, is this session about uh, promoting the offshore uh, registration of the companies? Because uh, my lawyer told me, oh, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at you, I'm sorry. But uh, my lawyer advised me not to do it. But currently, maybe for, for my uh, case, so I want to understand why to offshore because I can't see um, a clearly successful uh, startups. Uh, um, honestly, I'm not calling you a startup. Uh, currently, you are a business, well-established business, actually. So they are doing it offshore. Um, but I went to the LLC option. So what could say this is better than this? So I think it's a great question. I mean, if you look at the questions, thank you for calling us out on it. The question was to offshore or not. Uh, and we definitely chose the two offshore and the reasons why. Do you guys want to go after, why don't, why, why would you say to somebody, no, you should not offshore? I'm your lawyer, so I can't answer that question. Uh, I'm going I'm to help out my fellow lawyer here, okay? So, <laughs> no, look, I think uh, the question you asked is a valid one, especially because that's the topic of today. Um, to offshore or not to offshore is depends on what stage you're at, right? So uh, I think, do you offshore from day one? If you are, um, if you've got a lot of liquidity and you have you know, strong backers and you're probably a serial entrepreneur that's done this quite a few times, uh, I think you know, there's a lot of added value in doing it from the beginning because it's actually easier if you do it from the beginning, right? If you, uh, you know, if you're not a serial entrepreneur, and you don't really have investors yet, or maybe you have, you know, uh, we're looking at seed, uh, seed A. And yeah, then actually, you know, uh, the cost, like the money that it costs to offshore is not worth doing it at that time, okay? So it's, it's not like, uh, I don't think it's, if I don't do it from the start, I don't do it. No, I mean, they, they obviously did it for probably, you know, a, per a period of time. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, the, the, you know, you're going to know pretty soon. So I think, I think they knew, I mean, they, they, it was quite clear at some point, I think, that they, yes. you know, they need to do it. Yeah, just one comment from the startup point of view. Um, it's when, you, when you are going for investment, you will definitely need to go for offshore. Definitely. The, the, the legal structure here in Egypt is not for tech startups, specifically if you are a tech startup. If you are doing, um, uh, I don't know, a shop or something, it may be fine. Because if you are going for a tech startup and you have website and online payment and you have a lot of investors and, and, and especially VCs, um, maybe with angel investors, it's, it's fine to have a, um, an Egyptian company. But when things become very complicated, when you have a lot of money and you're raising a, a big uh, round of investment, definitely you should go for offshoring. Uh, where to offshore, this is a question you need to ask your lawyers and they should advise you case by case. That's definitely... Uh, the legal structure here is not for, for startups. It's not startup friendly. And you will face different type of problems and different, I, 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 had, I, I have been through a lot and uh, Amir have been through a lot. Maybe you have different um, problems, but definitely you will face a lot of troubles here. And yeah. yeah. Just a quick word on that. I think also the, the trend is changing. So with my angel investing hat on, 
the trend is changing. So like at the Cairo Angels, for example, uh, we, we don't, in, you know, we're not gonna invest unless offshoring is a condition, right? So, so that's the trend, and the trend is going more and more towards that. So, you know, keep that in mind. It's not just, I mean, VCs, that's like, they, they won't even consider it. They'll be like, you know what, go offshore and come back, yeah? Uh, you know, or come back to me when you're like almost done with it, then we'll talk, yeah? But, um, but even I think for angel investors now, it's, that's, the, that's the way it's, it's going, trend-wise. And especially if you are talking to regional VCs or regional investors, they will definitely ask for it. Other questions? Way in the back. Thank you. Uh, my question is for uh, the lawyers. Uh, I'm just wondering why you didn't mention Hong Kong as an offshore tax haven, uh, considering you mentioned other places. So I want to take your uh, advice on uh, why is it preferable or not to incorporate in Hong Kong? This is the first question. And the second one, uh, for example, if I'm starting a company in Egypt, should I first start it here in Egypt and, yet, and then incorporate in any of the offshore places as a uh, representative company? Or should I go directly to these offshore uh, uh, countries and start an account there, a bank account and a company as well? Thank you. Um, is this working? Yeah. Uh, right, Hong Kong. Wow. Um, look, Hong Kong is, is, is fine uh, for an offshore jurisdiction, um, but we generally only see Hong Kong when we're looking to enter the SaaS market. Um, it's not something that is quite common for European investors or US investors to go to Hong Kong. Okay. Um, the other aspect is the bank account is in a the trust services you have to set up at Hong Kong. So generally, you'll all. Um, yeah, so the agents that you work with in Hong Kong will, will provide you with trust services in order for you to set up an offshore company in Hong Kong. Um, the thing about it is that it can be very expensive and very costly. Uh, banks, you can set up a bank account, but it's very difficult to set up a bank account. You have to go through a lot of compliance, and you have to have quite a lot of transactions going through the bank in Hong Kong for them to accept you as a client. So we don't really advise on Hong Kong unless you're, you know, you're pretty much a medium or large size business, and you're looking to enter the South Asian market. That's really the requirements. Whether you set up a company in Egypt and then or you set up the offshore first. Um, generally, I always say set up the company in Egypt first. You need to have operations here. This is where you're working. So you need to have your employment contracts in place. You need to have everything done here, your licensing, everything. It needs to be done here. You're operational here. So have the LLC set up here. And then when you come to go to the next stage of the company's growth where you are raising funds, that's when you go and you set up an offshore company. Um, believe it or not, it's easier to set up an LLC and then set up an offshore company and get the offshore company to acquire the company in Egypt than it is to set up an offshore company and then set up an LLC and have it as a majority shareholder. Um, it's easier, why? It's just because of compliance and documents and stuff that at Gafi. And that's just basically how, how it works. Um, so that's generally what we advise to do. Yeah, nothing really to add to that. I just think, um, look, you know, on the jurisdiction issue, again, it's a very complicated thing. Um, but as Sharif was saying, it's really driven by region, right? So, you know, if you look at uh, Southeast, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, if you have an investor coming from there, or if you invest, you know, if you have a, uh, the founding team there, it's Singapore or Hong Kong. Mauritius is very Africa focused. Uh, Dubai is very, uh, you know, MENA focused. And Malta and Gibraltar uh, are kind of southern med, you know, North Africa and southern Southern Europe, basically, right? So that, that that's why these are coming, right? And you know, and BVI as well, and Cayman service a lot of different countries. So that's that's where the drivers are. Okay.